Welcome back to The Jay Martin Show. My guest today is Martin Pelletier, Senior Portfolio Manager at Wellington Altus Trivest. And we went kind of all over the map with this one. We began by talking about the dumpster fire of Canadian politics. Then we got into the Canadian housing market. So apologies to my American viewers. The beginning might be a bit less interesting. And then we pivoted to a more global conversation about the energy crisis uh, spiraling out of the Ukrainian war and US dollar strength. So hope you enjoy this. As always in the show notes or the description, there is a there's a link where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I absolutely love writing it. I publish every Sunday and it's free. I'd love to have you join the team. Here's Martin Pelletje. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Jay Martin Show. And I'm joined right now by Martin Pelletier. Mark, Martin, how you doing? Good. Look, there's a handful of different directions I want to go today. I want to get a sense of where you're allocating capital, how you're managing cash on behalf of your clients, what you're staying away from, just as important. But right before I hit record, we started talking about these you know, civil divisions and civil unrest that we're seeing erupt really all over the world um, in your home province of Alberta, in Canada. Uh, I mentioned I'd heard about a candidate that was running, who was running on the promise of some kind of a separatist ideology for Alberta. I mean, country's loaded with energy, right? Um, it's not getting favorable treatment. And uh, I would imagine that message resonates with a ton of people. Um, so give me the breakdown, Martin, like what's going on right now? So we can start from the top down, a very high level uh, assumption. And there's a great book by Charles Goodhart talks about the, the great demographic reset. And what's happened is we've had deflationary pressures for years, for the greater part of the last 35 years, because we had a readily available source of labor. And as a result, that excess supply put down pr downward pressure on, on labor. And so we had deflationary uh, pressures overall. And as a result, you had a widening of the gap between the wealthier and the poor, uh, quantitative easing and monetary policy has done nothing for Main Street and a lot for those on Wall Street with asset inflation. And so all of a sudden you have a whole swath of individuals um, not getting paid to, to the extent that they would like to get paid to, to and, and can't establish a life on their own that their parents, baby boomer parents did um, because housing prices is, is too high. So as a result, you're getting a polarization politically, uh, globally, uh, not just in Canada, but also in the US and Europe and other jurisdictions, whereas the, the younger generation is saying, OK, um, I'm not happy about this and I'll swing votes from one extreme to the other. And then federally, you're seeing that with uh, Pierre Polyev getting votes from Jagmeet Singh, which they're both on opposite ends of the spectrum. And so you have a whole class of younger people who are looking for sort of some form of equality or just a chance to be able to get ahead. Looking at back, tying it back to Alberta, you have a situation where um, you have um, a province that has been generating a significant amount of revenue and taxes and royalties um, and, and being distributed throughout the country. Uh, uh, sharing the benefit from oil and gas. At the same time, you had um, an anti-oil development policy, such as Bill C-69 from Trudeau. And uh, so you've got a lot of people who are not happy because that capital is no longer coming into the province and we can't grow our energy. And so as a result, uh, we can't grow our economy um, other than, you know, keeping production flat and, uh, and, and, you know, not being able to take it beyond that. And so you have a portion of the population that's not happy about that and trying to get more rights or a fair share, a better, better deal for Alberta, not unlike what Quebec has done. And her name is Danielle Smith. Did I get that yeah. right? What, yeah. what do you give her in terms of odds? Is she resonating with the Albertan public? Is this message, is it getting a positive response? That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't make bets on politics. Uh, right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really, I would think that the probability is probably higher for her to get in. Yeah. But there's also um, a large swath of individuals who have moved into the province from other jurisdictions like British Columbia and, and Ontario because our lifestyle and affordability is that much better. Um, you know, the average housing price here is four or 500,000 versus a million bucks in, in those other, other areas. And so, yeah. You have a whole bunch of people that have moved over here with uh, their own political views. And so, you know, that may uh, support the NDP, for example, Rachel Notley. So um, a lot of a lot of uncertainties. Yeah. Yeah. You're seeing that. 
Okay, I'm actually trying to lock up Pierre Polivare for this show right now. So if anybody oh. watching knows that guy, <laughs> got a few friends putting a bug in his ear, but um, I'm trying to get him on because I'd love to chat with that individual. Now, you mentioned something about like sort of up and coming generation um, and the wealth disparity. And, you know, I actually heard some conversations like this at a party I was at recently and there were some super smart uh, and I guess how I would describe you know, super competent, uh, but in the early twenties, um, having a conversation and it was sort of along the lines of, you know, the, 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 the game has been played already, right? We can't afford any of this stuff and we won't ever be able to looking at the right direction prices are headed. So why would we try, you know, it's kind of this, like, if you're down 10, 10, nothing, and it's the, you know, third period, like, yeah, you hit that sense of apathy where you're like, I can't, I can't even attempt to level the playing field here. So, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to opt out. Right. And we're seeing this like quiet quitting trend now. I don't know if you've been seeing this, right. And, and various versions of, and I get it. Like if, if you, you know, woke up and you start looking at the monopoly board and you can see that the disparity between yourself and whoever else is just like infinite. Right. And you would maybe make the assumption that somebody had cheated or the rules were unfair. How did that person get so far ahead of me? Um, and you can kind of like understand their mentality a little bit, but how, do, from your perspective, Martin, like, how does that, how do you run that forward? What, what occurs there? More, more populist uprisings? Like what, what do you think? So I, 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 I'm an optimist by nature, but also, you know, don't let that get out of control from being a real, uh, from looking at things from a realistic standpoint and facts. Sure. The facts are, is that, um, the U.S. economy is a powerhouse and, and it is dynamic and it will change and it will adapt like any other ecosystem. And so, for example, um, there's a whole swath of people, younger people that are told you go to university, you get your degree and you've got this great paying job and you'll be able to start your life. It was the way out of poverty. It was a way out of poverty for baby boomers. It was a way out of poverty, poverty for my generation, Generation X. But it is no longer the case. Um, so much for the younger millennials or Gen Z. Um, and the narrative is, is changed such that uh, COVID had accelerated, in my opinion. And so people are saying, well, there's no more tech jobs, for example. Well, actually, I just read an article today that uh, tech jobs, tech job postings are up 60% from last year. They're just not at Snap, who's laying off 25% of their workforce. They're not at any of the um, very uh, low cap, uh, cost of capital dependent uh, quantitative easing type of uh, no cash flow, high burn rate tech companies, and they're going into other areas and other companies that need to high grade their technology. So that isn't going away. And it actually is growing. The fastest growing tech uh, areas are in Houston. Detroit was number two, mm. uh, Orlando, Florida. And so it's no longer San Jose, California, right? It's no longer San Francisco, um, it's other areas that are, that are changing. And so as a young person, you can complain and say there's no work or you can adapt. And so there are areas, for example, that um, there's 11 and a half million job openings in the U.S. And, uh, and, and, and so these younger people are going into places like Starbucks and they're saying, I'm not getting paid enough. So let's unionize um, the same thing in, in other areas. Or you can say, go into the services sector, um, you can make a hundred thousand dollars a year being a plumber and start a plumbing business and have other plumbing uh, employees and move live in Calgary buy a house for five hundred thousand dollars and you have two people making you know combined income of two hundred thousand dollars a year and you're not working weekends and you have a crew that that are doing plumbing on people's houses that you can't disrupt and so there's a big shortage of of trades and and so there's sure there's a, a stereotype about that. But I have no problem with my kids if they want to get into, the, into that area. There'll be plenty of work and they'll get paid well. And if they're living in places like Calgary, they'd be able to live, build, a, build a life for them. Maybe not Vancouver, maybe not Toronto. But uh, if you're a big outdoors person like ourselves, then you know, maybe it's not such a bad place. The Emergency Inflation Briefing is coming up on September 7th, right here on our YouTube channel. We have received hundreds of newsletter responses, YouTube comments, Twitter comments, asking us for strategies to invest through an inflation cycle because we haven't seen inflation numbers like this in over 40 years. Therefore, any investors or money managers who experienced that have since retired. So what we're gonna do is bring in a bunch of experts that I respect and listen to what they have to say in terms of how they are allocating their capital. 
Now, I'm a firm believer that nobody has the correct strategy. People are too unique. Our risk tolerances are all different. So what we can do is hear from as many experts as possible, steal from their perspectives and strategies, and then craft our own strategy that will work best for us. So on September 7th, right here on the YouTube channel, we are hosting the Emergency Inflation Briefing. And I will be joined by Danielle DiMartino Booth, the author of Quail Intelligence, Luke Groman, the founder of Forest for the Trees, Andy Sheckman, president at Miles Franklin Precious Metals, Sandeep Singh, CEO and president of Asisco Gold Royalties, plus one earlier stage gold development story that I'm quite excited about. September 7th, right here on the YouTube channel, the Emergency Inflation Briefing. Come by, say hi, ask questions. I'll be there. Hope you're there too. No, not such a bad place at all. Yeah, we left Vancouver four years ago, my wife and I, when we had our second little boy on the way. And now we've got three and it was the best move ever from Vancouver yeah. to a town of 20,000 people. And just the quality of life, the peace of mind, the community. I mean, it ticks so many boxes. The affordability, of course, although the town that I moved to became mm -hmm. one of those like COVID hotspots, you know, it's 45 minutes outside of Metropolis, but there's only 25, 20,000 people in it. So it's like it became one of those towns that people just flooded to. Yeah. Um, despite ourselves, we did really well on our home here, but you yeah. know, uh, anyways, okay. So I want to, uh, I want to pivot a little bit and I know your, your focus is energy. Do I have that correct? No, and it's, it's, it's not it, uh, energy. I do have an energy background. So I spent 10 years in energy, um, okay. and in the last 12, 13 years, we're more of a generalist. Um, so we've been underweight energy, uh, since 2014, all the way through to 2021, and so we did have a period that, uh, you know, I put my, my energy hat in the closet, but now I'm dusting it off um, yeah. and, uh, and positioning back into the sector. Okay, I knew about your background. That's where I was, mm -hmm. I was coming from. So yeah. talking about your forecast, there's all kinds of wild speculation about what we may see at a super macro level globally this winter. Uh, one really, you know, exciting thesis is the breakup of the EU. And we're starting to see kind of almost consensus within mainstream media um, that once it gets cold, Countries are going to have to start making really tough decisions about who they align with. Yeah. Um, and um, so you're repositioning yourself. You're putting your focus back to energy after sounds like eight years of not really touching it much. So talk to me about where you're putting cash, Martin, and, and what you're expecting. Okay. So um, our biggest premise, we do something called goals-based benchmarking for all of our clients. So what that means is that each client has a specific goal that they want to achieve. And, uh, and then we set a target return around that. And then we minimize the drawdowns and maximize the uh, upside participation. And we can do that through various means. Um, and so, for example, in March of 2020, uh, we had a 15% weighting in 20-year treasuries, uh, which really helped uh, because those were up 45%, helped offset our long equity exposure. We've taken that down and we said, what's the greatest risk that, uh, that we're facing in today's current environment? Well, um, it's inflation. And it's also uh, a commodity complex that's been underinvested in for a greater part of the last uh, 10 years. And eventually that does play catch up. And so everybody's so focused on demand interruption and looking at, uh, at, at electric vehicles and, and going towards, towards that away from internal combustion engines and, and peak demand, that they lost sight of what was happening on the supply side. And, uh, and we saw that through uh, policies, anti-oil development policies in all developed countries. Um, I read the other day that Europe's got actually more shale resource than the US, but you know, they've got, they're not gonna be able to tap into it because they've banned fracking and everything else. Yeah. Um, and so energy security got, we got complacent, energy security got put on the back burner. As a result, you had uh, a, a whole area like EFI markets, uh, Europe, Australia and the Far East, but more so the EU, um, that allowed itself to be, get played totally by Russia and, uh, and Russia has become a major supplier of energy. So they relinquished the potential to offset that with domestic supply into jurisdictions like Russia and, uh, and, and, and other developed countries are, are going down that path. So Russia used that for its own advantage with Ukraine. And uh, as a result, we're having uh, an energy short, ma massive energy shortfall in Europe. And where it gets really troubling is this is happening at the same time that the US is tightening and raising interest rates. And it's important to understand monetary policy, how that ties into energy policy as well. Because um, as the US is raising uh, their interest rates, the, Europe, the EU has to raise interest rates alongside them, because if they don't, the euro is going to 
is going to sell off. Okay. And so, but they don't want to raise interest rates when they're in a recession and energy and energy crisis. And so do they raise interest rates to defend their currency or do they let the currency devalue? And then that will actually uh, propagate even more inflation because if you're importing goods and your currency is getting hit, look, look to pull up Argentina, Venezuela, um, uh, Turkey is a perfect example. Yeah. And, and so they're a real situation. Does that mean it's the collapse of the euro, um, uh, the European Union? I don't know, but it doesn't look good. And, and, and so what we mean by positioning around energy is understanding how it influences um, countries, currencies, because it is playing a much more important role. And, and so as a result, we took our EFI exposure, European exposure, down to almost 0%, um, which is quite a big call for uh, a traditional conservative manager back in January. And it's the best, one of the best decisions we've ever made. At the other side, we've added in an inflation hedge because every 1% a rise in inflation, oil prices and gas prices go up by 8%. And uh, so you don't need much to add an inflation hedge. And so we added, a, we took our energy position up to 10, 15%. And as a result, our, our conservative balance portfolios are flat this year, maybe down a couple of like one or 2%. And everybody else, all of our peers are down 15, 16%. And so that goes back to our goals-based benchmark is how can we protect against drawdowns, which we did this year. And then now it's like, how do we make money on the recovery? Okay. And outside of energy, any other inflation hedges, Martin, that you focus on or hold in the portfolio? Well, yeah. So you have to be careful about your duration exposure. And so what we mean by that is managing duration risk. And not, not just in, and duration risk is interest rate sensitivity. So it's not just bonds. So bonds are important. The bonds that you have, how long those bonds are, um, because regulators will force a conservative investor to have some bonds. Um, so where uh, the bonds that we do own are, are U.S. dollars. And, uh, and floating. And so we have to make a little bit of money on currency. Um, we'll talk about the cat in a bit, but, um, and then looking at, um, uh, the, at the equities, you can look at areas that have done well, some materials have done well, uh, you know, commodities, the oil and gas complex has done well. Some financial services should participate, should uh, benefit from, from rising rates. I said should, some of them, um, and, and industrials and consumers uh, consumer discretionary. So there's, there are certain segments to be aware of that, uh, that can protect yourself against inflation. Do you hold any gold? I do. Yep. For the first time, we, I mean, it hasn't been the best trade for us. Um, but we bought gold for the first time at, uh, in the fall of last year. And, uh, so we're down a little bit on it, but, um, yeah, we did buy some. Interesting. What inspired you to buy gold for the first time? Typically, gold will historically, our analysis has indicated that gold will do better at the early stages of inflation and not do so well as uh, in the mid to late stages as, as rates bring that inflationary pressures down. That didn't play out this year. It didn't, it didn't happen. So that was our thesis. So we're, we're going to revisit that. You know, we're not always right with these calls, but um, it made sense to us at the time. And it still does make a little bit of sense. We'll see. Um, our, our, on the flip side, we have... 50, 60% of our assets in US dollar, dollar denominated assets. So uh, that's been helpful. Now, a common pushback when people talk about gold not performing that I hear is, well, actually gold's doing just fine, except relative to US dollars. It's up in every other currency. So it's yep. more of a US dollar story than it goes, yep. but I guess actually US dollar and rubles, believe it or not. But, but yeah, those two, you know. Um, does that ring true for you? And does that, so when you buy gold, you buy this as kind of like ballast or are you looking for a bit of return? Um, why, why put the gold in your portfolio? Downside just, protection. Just downside. downside yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Got it. and to be Got honest, it. we have a much bigger weight in US dollars and uh, the US dollar has been for years, everyone's been trying to call the end of the world reserve currency. It's yeah. just it's complete BS, in my opinion. There's nothing that's going to be, be able to replace the weaponization of the U.S. dollar and so on and so forth. I mean, the bottom line is, is until you time, tell me what a viable alternative is to the U.S. dollar, and it's not gold, and it's certainly not euros anymore, what is it? And it's not yen, and, and you know, maybe it's rubles. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, but the bottom line is, is that um, the flight to safety is U.S. dollars, and uh, that's, that hasn't changed, and we don't see that changing anytime soon. No, and I, I agree with you. And I'm, I'm not, 
maybe as certain about the future viability of U.S. dollar as reserve currency, but similarly, like I can't name a sufficient replacement that could handle the scale and scope. Um, and if you have any doubts about people's confidence in U.S. dollars, just look at the Dixie. It's like, well, what? there's nothing to talk about here, right? When things get rough, people go to U.S. dollars. But also look at the economy. I mean, it's unbelievable. And it's, going, it's undergoing a transformation right now. And so um, we're seeing uh, Brookfield. I did an interview talking about Brookfield and Intel building uh, a, a chip uh, manufacturing, and and you know we're seeing onshoring of manufacturing away from Asia back into the U.S. Hey, there as a young person, there's a job for you. Like, don't yeah. complain. You know, there, there's yeah. going to be plenty of. You have to look for the where, as Gretzky said, look where the puck's going, and uh, there's plenty of opportunities for young people there. And so the U.S. economy is I, one of my one of my pieces. I'll back it up. Um, I have it framed in my office and it's the battle of midway. And I talked about the battle of midway and I really recommend watching the TV show. If you don't want to read the history books or not TV show, the movie and the U S was attacked. Um, I did this during COVID and within, and they lost their entire Pacific fleet within six months. It took the Japanese head on at uh, midway and they by lock, they had four carriers um, that were not impacted by bombing. So they retrofitted and changed their entire strategy around these four carriers. And they took them on head on six months after losing the entire Pacific fleet and they won. And so I think that's very telling of the dynamic nature of the US economy and how powerful it is. Everyone's been calling uh, its demise, but we still see it being the strongest and the most prolific economy globally. And they're adapting, they've adapted to COVID and they're adapt adapting to closed markets with China. Um, they're, they have not yet adapted on the energy uh, side, but I wouldn't discount that. And so if I'm gonna put my dollars anywhere, I'm gonna put it with the, with, with the US going into Midway, because um, when they're down and out, um, they really, I, don't, I can't think of any other economy that is as robust and strong as the US, US economy. And so do you think that the leverage Russia has now and will increasingly have over Western European countries like Germany, like Italy, like Norway, Hungary, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this winter shakes out. And I am really curious when Germans can't afford energy this November and the citizens are going to say, look, we don't care about the history of alliances. We want food and energy and our neighbor, hostile as they may be, has cheap access to both. And so it's time to rethink the geopolitical map here a little bit. Now, there's a lot there and there's so many, you know, there's a lot of complexity with, it's not that simple, right? Um, but is that the beginning from your perspective of the crippling of an empire? Like are those little cracks in the empire or are you still your, your American bull long-term and there's yeah. lots more bullets in the chamber that we haven't seen been played yet on behalf of the US government? You always have to try and find the ways to make money in all markets. In this current market environment, if I'm going to allocate any sort of money, it's not going to be in, in a, a region that has been uh, actively uh, hostile towards uh, conventional oil and gas development, um, which can be used to facilitate the transformation towards more, more renewable sources. Um, you use those, the revenues generated from that to tr help transform your economy um, instead of doing an all or nothing strategy. Now there are pockets of that within the US. Uh, the, in California, for example, uh, they're going completely electric vehicles by 2035, um, but their, their grid can't even support existing uh, draw uh, uh, base load demand. And if there's hot weather, for example, there's blackouts. And so you're telling me you're gonna replace the entire uh, fleet of vehicles to electric vehicles by 2035, all new vehicle sales. I mean, that's just, a, it's not realistic. It's not going to happen. And so a lot of that talent and, and you have to pay for it for some, from way, uh, all those subsidies via taxation. So these individuals are leaving and they're going to, like I said, Detroit, uh, Orlando, Florida, Austin, Texas, is awesome. Texas. Houston, yeah. right. And more favorable jurisdictions. And so that capital is very mobile. It will, it will change, it will go to those with the, uh, the path of least resistance. And, and so on, on a global scale, that's gonna to go to the US um, and it's not coming to Canada. That's why our currency is delinked from oil 
because there's no place to invest in Canada uh, compared to the U.S. The only place that there was traditionally a place to invest was in oil and gas, and there's no way they can do that now. Two things, the Emergency Act killed that. Nobody wants to invest outside of this uh, country because they're worried about comp uh, the, the risk of, of geopolitical. And then two is there's no infrastructure to, to build out the energy um, and expand it. And so the capital hasn't come here and our dollar's been dealing from oil. And, uh, and it's going to, all that capital is going into the US and US dollars and its currency is getting stronger. And so we think that trend's only gonna continue. Um, we don't see reversal in that at any time soon. And I got to ask, as a fellow Canadian, do you see that? So just to back up, foreign investments not hitting Canada because of the Emergency Act. You're talking about the confiscation of financial assets last year. Yeah, okay. And so, you know, thinking through, like, I guess the real politic angle of, of that geopolitical map, and I wonder how much that's going to occur at a, at a micro level, say, within Canada. Um, we have the resources that the entire world needs. We're a landmass larger than the United States with less people than the state of California stocked with natural resources. We could and should have the world by the balls with the correct leadership, right? Um, I speculate, like, I wonder what it's going to take to get there and not with reckless abandon. You know, I think we've got very high environmental standards in Canada, which is great um, and allows us to, de to develop in a mature and uh, sustainable way. That's my belief anyways. Um, and, you know, typically populations tend to pivot from one party far, say on the left to the other party far on the right. And I think that the population is getting quite exhausted with Trudeau right now. That would be my <laughs> thoughts, um, you know? And so it does make me optimistic. I don't know if, if you know, Pierre Polivar is the guy, I, I don't know, right? But, you know, I, I wonder and how much can you do in four years, eight years, but like, you know, do you expect us to pendulum them back to maybe a more business friendly, open for business? Um, and, and how how tough is that going to be to rebuild our reputation on the global stage? Well, the rebuilding is probably, you know, the far end of the spectrum in regards to what we need to do. Um, we have to any sort of changes politically. I'm not as optimistic as you are. Um, the reason being is you have I, I call Canada as a culture of complacency and we've been spoiled and um, we're not as innovative as the U.S. We are certainly not as productive as the U.S. and we've had to rely on our currency. And, uh, and the only time we did get to par with the U.S. was because of energy and resources, which we've actually purposely tried or been trying to phase out by putting um, a cap on infrastructure via putting massive restrictions on the building out of that infrastructure via Bill C-69. Um, sure, you may revoke that Bill C-69, let's say Pierre or whoever's in charge gets into power, um, but is that really gonna change things? Is that gonna bring capital back in? And I think you have to have a buy-in from the mass population. Um, ideally, uh, my favorite saying is idealism is really easy if it costs somebody else for it. <laughs> and right. um, if you're sitting in Ontario, and uh, I love Ontario, there are a lot of clients there. Um, and, um, and I'm looking at where, you know, if you're an average person in Ontario, you've made a bunch of money in your house and real estate. And you're like, well, I really don't want a pipeline coming through here. I don't want any, any sort of in, any sort of resource de energy development. I would like to have electric vehicles. I would like to have um, solar on my roof. And those are all really nice things. I agree, right? But if it's costing somebody else that and not you, it's an easy position to take. So Europe is, is where I'm keeping a close eye on um, because there still are protests um, against resource development in, in those areas. They are putting in anti-fertilizer policy in, in Holland, for example, which can impact food. And so is there enough pain um, I've been looking on Twitter, all of these uh, power bills that these people in Italy are paying. It's insane. And so is it going to be the pain going to be so high that they need to revisit um, some of their longer term policies? And uh, I think that's what you need to happen um, to get buy in from everybody, because right now people are just too comfortable. Interesting. Yeah. OK. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, I just had to look it up here as you were chatting, because you know, you mentioned the sort of prosperity of Ontario and, you know, 
once you're in a good place, you want to maintain, right? And not disrupt. I mean, we don't want that pipeline. We don't need Alberta and gas, you know, oil and gas to get the tidewater. It doesn't affect us, right? Well, Alberta might have something to say about that. And we're seeing more, um, I think, sovereignty, like many sovereign eruptions occur, whether it's this candidate, um, Danielle Smith in Alberta or the Saskatchewan. Now, what was it in Saskatchewan recently? Um, Saskatchewan threatens to arrest federal agents tras- trespassing on farms uh, if they're there to do diligence on fertilizer allocation. And we're starting to see like little micro eruptions like this rebelling against the federal leadership at the provincial level, which is inspiring to me because one thing I love about the United States, my wife's American, so we are continuously having the conversation about if and what would be our line to pull the plug in Canada and boogie down to Texas, where she's from. And, you know, we've, we've come really close. We've been to Texas twice in the last year and a half looking at property. Um, what I love about the United States is the sovereignty of the states. And like peak COVID, I still had to travel a lot for work. And it was like every single state I went to, whether it was Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, Texas, Mississippi, Arizona, it was a whole new adventure in terms of risk management and their approach to risk management. They all do their own thing, which is lovely because as a citizen, it lets you choose your own adventure. You know what I mean? If you're super conservative, go here. If you're like, leave me alone, go here, you know? And so, um, and I don't know if, you know, a Commonwealth country could ever get there. I don't think it's feasible, right? But we're starting to see demand for it. That's absolutely true. What do you think? Yeah, so mobility of labor is, um, is an important factor. And, and especially in this new world of a shortage of supply of quality work, workers, um, that's why I think there'll be wage inflation finally after, like I said, 35 years. Right. And so there'll be a, there'll be a demand for young, uh, talented individuals globally um, to go move to those jurisdictions. And so um, Canada, if it's not careful, and I did write a piece about this, is going to see a mass exodus of its young people. Um, and, and, and that's not a good thing. Uh, for example, if I, I showed, uh, if you were in, in the GTA, um, you could take your income, I think it was like 60 or $70,000 as a tech worker to hundred grand and by moving from the GTA into Denver of all places. And instead of paying, you can get a million dollar house for $500,000. So all of a sudden now you get a bump in your pay and you're in a house, right? And you're in Denver, which is a pretty awesome place because yeah. if you like skiing and biking like me, you know, you get all of that. Um, and so I think we have to be careful about that. And we can't take that for granted. And looking at Canada as a whole, there was an interesting stat, and I did write about this in my post column, um, was that um, since March of 2020, 87.5% of the new jobs added in this country are government public service jobs. Now, we do need public service. I mean, the healthcare system has been taxed and, and teachers have been taxed. And, you know, obviously there needs to be some resources allocated in, in, the, in the midst of a, one of the biggest uh, healthcare crises in our, in our lifetime. Um, but not all of that, because we didn't see the same kind of numbers in the U.S. And so all of the jobs have been added at our, you know, 87, like I said, have been public service. And someone put a comment on my tweet. Well, this is great because they're going to pay taxes and everything else. I said, well, you know, how about you write me a check and I write you a check and we go to Costco and have some fun. Um, someone has to pay for these workers, right? And, and people just don't understand that. And uh, we can't, you know, break all the windows and, and replace all of them and saying that's economic growth. We need to attract young people. And, uh, and how do we do that? Because right now it, it Canada's, other than the, the, those who are not happy politically if, with who's in charge in the U.S., certainly who was previously in charge. Um, but a lot of that didn't cause these young people to move up into Canada. So you've mentioned wage inflation a couple of times. Can you walk me through your thesis there? What's going to be the catalyst for us to start seeing wage inflation? It's already starting. And so what I mean by that is in the U.S., you have 3.9% unemployment, um, 11 and a half million job openings. And there's a shortage of workers in, especially in the service side. Um, that is the same same situation up here in Canada. Um, you look at a restaurant and you're saying we're closing early because we can't get staff. Or I mean, I, I go to Whistler every year and and they reduce their hours at the restaurants or they're limiting the restaurants half full and they're they're keeping it half full because they don't have the staff to to open up the rest of it. And I think that is um, so, the start of something bigger. And I think COVID accelerated 
the uh, demand for, for labor. And it, it just, all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of baby boomers who retired and saying, I'm done working. I've had this lockdown. I'm going to spend my money and traveling and you only live once. And, and so they left the workforce. And then you have all of these young people who haven't been able to go in and, and step in, or some of them saying, I'll just sit in the sidelines, like you said. And so um, <clears throat> I think it's a bigger start of a trend that you have an aging workforce that is aging out. They have more demand on healthcare services, and there isn't uh, the, 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 the number of younger people to step in and fill those shoes. And that's not just, in, that's not just people say, well, I'll look at Japan. Japan had an aging workforce and they don't have inflation. Well, because they outsourced their entire workforce to China, who did, and now China's closing its borders, and you're having onshoring of manufacturing, onshoring of everything. And people want reliability over price. Um, a great example I use is my sons were big mountain bikers. He uh, his brake lever on his bike went, and it was forty bucks for a lever, but I had to wait two months for the lever, or do I replace the whole uh, braking system with cables and for two hundred bucks, and I get it back the next day? Well, I paid two hundred bucks. I think most people will do that. And, and so China is closing its doors. The pay disparity between uh, China and the U.S. has narrowed significantly. It went from 25 down to five. And, and so now you don't have that as an option anymore. So I, I think the, the younger person will have a lot more pricing power than they've ever had before on wages. And they're going to demand it because um, the cost of living has gone up because of energy and everything else. And, uh, and so I think this is going to accelerate that that whole process. And you think that occurs in time? So, you know, we're going to see inflation, therefore, and in wage inflation and necessity goods inflation, right? I mean, you're, you're yeah. bullish in energy because the price is going to go up, right? It's already becoming quite unaffordable for many people. And this winter, that'll probably increase even more. And, you know, we, we saw significant inflation six months ago begin to emerge or really get strong, but there was like discretionary spending inflation and then necessity spending inflation. And the discretionary yeah. Spending inflation seems to have come down a little yeah. bit, right? Yeah. You know, use, use car market, for example. Like it was yeah. the hottest chart in the world six months ago. Yeah. And that's come down. But the necessities, they're, they've maintained. And I would speculate food and energy probably going to keep going up. Um, and well, I would, I, I would say there's more commodity volatility. And so uh, I think lumber is a great chart because it, you know, it crashed and went back up again, crashed, went back up again. And I think we're going to see a lot of that uh, that volatility as people trying to figure out how much of it is going to be sticky and how much of it isn't. And that creates, that's only going to make the situation worse because um, if you're a producer in any of those areas and your commodity underlying your price taker and your underlying commodities, you know, one day up X amount and down X amount and we're getting 4% daily swings in it, you're not going to bring any more supply on the market. You're just going to sell it into the market to get cash flow and that's it. And you're seeing that with sure buybacks and dividends instead of capital reinvestment. So some of that will, I, I agree with you, it, it'll be volatile for the next little while, but longer term to be stickier. Other segments like you mentioned are coming down. So you brought up a good point. So I'm, I'm a believer that uh, we're going to hike and hold. And um, I think we're going to see inflation around 4%, not you know, eight and a half or nine or whatever that number you know, is it's going to come back down 4%. And uh, we're going to see you know, wages uh, support that and, and commodity prices support that. And, you know, interest rates um, at three and a half percent, um, four percent. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, a great example is um, if you can buy a house with a six percent mortgage rate and the house is 300 grand, or would you buy a six hundred thousand dollar house with a three percent mortgage rate? You're much better off paying the higher interest rate. So, um, in, in the lower asset price. And so I, I think we're going to be going through that kind of transition. Interesting. Interesting. So how do you feel about the Canadian housing market right now? Are you optimistic or are you a bit scared? Well, I have a little bit of home, home bias here in Calgary. Um, we did a love it or list it on our house, our own version of it. So we renovated our house and we're looking concurrently to see if there's something better. And so far we're loving it. Um, in the last five places I've looked at, um, there was actually competitive bids and people walking through the, the, the open houses with uh, live video streaming back to Ontario. Hmm. And so um, we're, 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 it's not, it's more bullish here in Calgary than anywhere else. Um, in other jurisdictions, I can't speak to, but it does make sense that um, with variable rates going up um, that 
um, the froth in those areas like GTA or Vancouver should be coming down. And interesting enough, you said you're in Squamish, but Camor is very similar to Squamish. And, uh, and a lot of people are actually moving from Camor back into Calgary because the pricing is similar in Camor as it is in uh, Squamish. Fascinating. Yeah. You know, I, I, I struggle with my, my expectations of the real estate market because of how nuanced the local, um, I guess, factors can be like, for example, yes, Squamish little town, 45 minutes outside of downtown Vancouver, Vancouver, by the way. So here's my thoughts on Vancouver, because I get into this debate all the time. And, you know, the only like bipartisan agreement in Vancouver seems to be that there's a housing crisis that needs to be fixed. And the housing crisis is that real estate's become uh, astronomically expensive and we need to fix this, right? And everybody seems to agree with this, except me. I, I sit there in these rooms and I'm like, like, look out a window, guys. Like, What about this city makes you believe it's ever going to be cheap? All right, we got the Pacific Ocean on one side, coastal mountains on the other, it's a small city surrounded by water on three sides, more or less an island, super lenient immigration policies. Like it's a market that's highly attractive. It's, it's governed predictably, it's safe, it's clean, you know, uh, and it's open to the entire world. It's a very finite inventory. Why on earth would this place be affordable to anybody except the super wealthy? I mean, that's just what happens to places like that. You know yeah. what I mean? And, you know, if there's a sticky, if there's like a, yeah, but right there is that um, it's the confiscation, confiscation of financial assets last year by Trudeau. I think he probably scared the world in terms of how yeah. safe of a safe haven are, are, you know, you have lots of Chinese money, you made a bit of dough and you're in mainland China. You want to get out of the country because maybe you don't know what's going to happen there. Vancouver has historically been a great money garage, right? So there's tons of, tons of vacant condos and, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but it just is what it is. I mean, debate it all you want. It occurs. And yeah. um you know, that's, that's, I think, a big trigger point that could shift a little bit if money gets scared of our, our leadership. I mean, that would make sense to me. Squamish, similarly, it's like a little strip of land. I mean, on a highway called the sea to sky for a reason. There's ocean here and mountains here and one little strip you can only expand so much. And so, you know, I, I wonder about, yeah, I, I kind of feel like there's so much nuance in the localities of real estate that it's hard to really put my wrap my mind around like a broad spectrum forecast but at the same time you have places not to pick on hamilton ontario but you have places like hamilton ontario that are more expensive than san jose california yeah that's crazy yeah and, and so i've been to both and san jose is freaking awesome i love to live there it's, it's very similar to what you just described about vancouver right and so there are some dislocations that will not be as protected as uh, what you just described and so yeah. Um, I, I like the way you're thinking because we we deploy that that kind of strategic thinking on our uh, tactical asset allocation. Um, so barriers to entry and and you know destinations for for growth and opportunities and, and so that that level of, of of thinking should be deployed in in other areas as well too. So walk me through Martin. Walk me through the firm the work you do, the kind of clients you handle, um, where we can hear more about what it is you do and the content you create in addition to the money that you manage. Yeah. So what, what we try and really focus on is removing the emotion from investing. And uh, that's key. We do not sell any sort of financial products, which tends to be the, the industry standard. Um, is I'm going to try and sell you an idea or sell you a narrative. And, and then here's a product that you want to buy. Uh, we don't do any of that. Um, it's more along the lines of how can we protect you against yourself <laughs> and how do we protect ourselves against yourself. And so we have a lot of entrepreneurs that are clients, for example, that um, had a sense of control over their over their destiny because they were running a business and they could, you know, weather the storm, weather the recession, they got hit with everything. And then now they've sold said business, for example, and now they have to relinquish that control over to somebody else or try and do it themselves, which they don't have an idea about. And so we try... And, and we take those clients in, uh, high net worth investors. We also run a uh, um, an, an institutional investment fund, um, level fund, and um, we just won an award on that, to, uh, uh, naming us alongside CI and financial and the others. So we're the David versus Goliath. And, uh, <laughs> and so what we, we try and do is something called goals-based benchmarking. That's the gist of it. I mentioned it to you earlier. 
Um, everybody's different. Everybody's got different goals and objectives. Uh, some people may sell their real estate and, and uh, rent and want to live off their investments and all they need is four or 5% and they can't go do ladder GICs. So how do they get four or 5% and take as little risk as possible? Um, and that's a tough thing to do as interest rates are going up and your bonds are going down. Um, some clients want to be more tactical in their growth and uh, want to continue to, to leave uh, something for a charity or for a younger person, uh, for their next generation, for the kids. How do we do that? And they may be in six to 8% or 10 to 15%. Um, and then we design a portfolio around that and, uh, and what we do is we take the um, bell curve of that distribution and we narrow it down as much as possible so we get a lot of predictability in those returns. We do that through a risk management and some of the things I mentioned earlier about tactical, tactical asset allocation. And so we can do that because we have 50 clients. That's it, 50 households. Got it. Um, yeah, and ranging in size, our, high, our largest client would have about 500 million in net worth and, and uh, our smallest would be probably about two or three million. And, uh, and so we can do something a, more, a little more specialized uh, than what you would get uh, um, out there right now. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And entrepreneurs that exit their business are very smart to seek oh, yeah. out professional wealth management, just because what makes a great entrepreneur typically makes a terrible investor. You need to be a perpetual optimist, right? To succeed as an entrepreneur. But the best investors I know are just perpetual skeptics and cynics, right? They're you know, I, I poke fun at myself in this regard. I was an entrepreneur before I became an investor and I used to look at deals when I began allocating cash with a buddy of mine who had an opposite journey and he'd been managing money for a few years already. And we could both go and hear the same pitch. Yeah. And he would leave and say, not a chance because of one, two, and three. And I would yeah. leave saying, this could be great. All they have to do is fix one, two, and three. And we're looking at yeah. the same thing, right? Just different perspective on, on uh, you know, yeah. So- yeah. Um, okay, very cool. And, um, and if people want to read what you're writing, Martin, where should I send them? Um, so I write for the Financial Post. I've been a columnist for about 12 years for the Investment Pro section. Um, I write every Monday. It comes out so you can find me there. And uh, that's probably the best place to start. And, uh, and then you can, you know, just Google and, and, and find me in various interviews such as, uh, as this one. All right. Awesome. Look, Martin, appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. You betcha. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you for watching this interview. Now, three things before I let you go. Number one, I publish a weekly newsletter and I love writing it. I share my biggest takeaways and action items from the conversations that I have on this channel. In addition, my thoughts on current events, economic events, political events, and you can subscribe for free. Just hit the pinned comment right beneath this video or just go to jmartin.club and you can subscribe on the website. I'd love to have you join the team. Number two, ad revenue from this channel is donated to an organization that is super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Now, Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. And the way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing, career training, and just generally positive influences on their life. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, thanks again.